Do you think America is such a bad country that we need to be accompanied by a cadre of lies, that we can't look our past straight in the eye? Because if we do, our young people will get so turned off that they'll leave or they'll become anti-American. These monuments deceive us, and they, they don't tell the stories that I think would restore um, good values. The challenge with so many of these monuments is that they leave out more than they illuminate. A lot of monuments, a lot of historic houses, a lot of museums and so on, make us more stupid about history in general and about that event in particular than before we went there. I find that when people are told truthful things that have been kept from them, uh, they're happy to get that. And then they look elsewhere for other truths that have been withheld from them. So the very first puncture of myth in people's minds is the beginning of a journey for truth. History is sometimes embellished to present stories that fit America's ideological needs. The site of Lincoln's birthplace does this in a couple of ways, beginning with the authenticity of the cabin he was born in. It's my understanding it's the original cabin. I, I don't know, it may be a replica, but I, I understood it was the original. And... I think it's important that visitors do know that this may not be the original cabin. I think it's important that they know that we refer to it as a symbolic cabin. I asked if it was an original, uh, if it was the original cabin, and, and the answer was that, that, uh, that the National Park Service feels like that some of the logs are original. They don't know which ones, but uh, that, uh, that some of the cabin is original and that it looks like the cabin that was here. In 1895, uh, a entrepreneur purchased the Sinking Spring Farm, Lincoln's fa uh, birthplace farm, and he hired an agent to go out and put a cabin on it. And so this agent went off and found some cabin that was nearby and not needed, and he put it on the farm. It went off to the Buffalo World's Fair, and there it was on display next to the Jefferson Davis log cabin. Now Jefferson Davis wasn't even born in a log cabin, but that's okay, never mind. Then after that exposition closed, the guy who invented these two cabins took them off to Coney Island to display them there. But on the trip to Coney Island, the two cabins got commingled. And that didn't stop them. They put up one big cabin, and they called it the Lincoln-Davis Log Cabin. And presumably, they were both born there, I guess, on, on separate days. Finally, a, a wealthy magazine publisher bought the farm, speaking literally, and he hired a famous American architect to devise a suitable temple, really, to put the cabin in. But when they did, they found, alas, the architect had miscalculated and the temple was too small. Architect knew just what to do. He had the cabin cut down in size. So the, this cabin, which was built to the approximate right dimensions of, of normal pioneer cabins, we don't know the precise dimensions of Lincoln's, but is now two thirds as big as it should be. And all it does is it makes for a bigger story because it's a smaller cabin. 
chiseling to the monument itself, uh, there are the words here over the log cabin where Abraham Lincoln was born. I think at the time that the cabin was placed in the memorial, it was truly believed that that was the correct cabin. And today, after additional research, I think it's understood that there's just not enough documentation to support the authenticity. And that's why the Park Service refers to it as being symbolic. A more serious issue involves Lincoln's role in freeing black slaves during the Civil War. All my life as a child, that's all I ever heard, that Lincoln freed the slaves. You look at the sort of iconography in Harper's Magazine and the like, and Lincoln frees the slaves. The textbooks will say, well, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and, and he was the great emancipator, and, and that's how blacks won their freedom. What is really important is that the public recognize that Lincoln played a role in the freeing of the slaves, but that the slaves played a major role in freeing themselves. Blacks won their freedom because uh, for 30 years before the Civil War, they participated in a great movement of resistance, well, resistance in the South, underground railroads, uh, fighting the Fugitive Slave Acts, disobeying the law, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman were the key players in the great movement for the abolition of slavery. And I think by not accepting that notion, you create an environment where people begin to think, well, African Americans have always had things handed to them. Um, it gets, gets carried into the notions of welfare and the like. But if you then change that and you say, wait a minute, African Americans played a major role in their own freedom, and more importantly, a major role in helping the North win the Civil War. That changes the way people will come to thinking about African American culture. When you look at a monument, a memorial, you don't want to just read the words, important as they are. Sometimes what the artist is doing, sometimes the images, make more of an impact than the words. Monuments are created to be dramatic, and by being dramatic, sometimes there is a great need to embellish. Um, there's a great need to sort of create a sense that this is a larger-than-life individual or a larger-than-life story. Um, I just feel very strongly that while that's important for people to be able to find their heroes, I just don't think we need to do the embellishment. I think the stories are strong enough. Uh, all across the United States, we see white explorers, or discoverers, as they're incorrectly called, towering over Native Americans who are often seated or lying down or at least well below uh, in the scale of things. We also see conquerors just depicted huge on big, tough horses. Um, horses that never were. So the scale an artist uses, the uh, business of who's on top and who's strong, that can just make us think, well, yes, of course, of course it happened this way. The best monuments should be able to tell complex stories, um, but that means that the design has to both be visual as well as educational. Monuments don't usually encourage you to stand back and say, Hmm, did this happen like this? Monuments often make Native Americans out to be naive without any concept of commerce. The monument memorializing the purchase of Manhattan by the Dutch for $24 worth of beads typifies this myth. It stands in Battery Park on the southern tip of the island of Manhattan. Think about this monument. The first thing that's amazing about it is just to look at it. What do we see? We see this nearly naked Native American and this fully clothed, even with a jacket on, Dutchman. Now, I've been to New York City in August, and I can tell you that if this purchase that never took place took place in August, that is one hot Dutchman. I've been to Manhattan in February, and I can tell you if this purchase that never took place took place in February, that's one cold Indian. So 
what we're really seeing is we're seeing primitive and civilized. And the whole story is really about poor, stupid, primitive. Those Indians, they didn't even know what land is worth. I mean, $24 won't buy you a postage stamp worth of Manhattan today. Second of all, the Dutch never gave beads to anybody, as far as we can tell. There's a, the statue, of course, shows them with some beads dangling that they're giving to the Indian. What the Indians wanted and what they got was stuff they couldn't make themselves, particularly metal kettles, steel axes, steel knives, guns, and brightly colored woven wool blankets. So for some fee, maybe something like $2,400, as far as I can tell, worth of this stuff, the Dutch bought Manhattan from the Canarsis. They bought it from the wrong tribe. Now, you can go to Canarsis, you can go to it on the subway. When you come up, you are in Brooklyn. In fact, you're in East Brooklyn at the end of the line. That's where the Canarsis lived. Why shouldn't they sell Manhattan? Wasn't theirs. For centuries thereafter, Europeans bought land from the wrong tribe, or they set up two factions within a tribe, and they bought it from one faction, bribed them, paid those folks a whole bunch of stuff, and then there'd be maybe a civil war or a war between two different Native American groups. Therefore, the French or the British or the Dutch didn't have to fight the natives. They were fighting each other, and meanwhile, the, the land ended up in European hands. American mythology has been suggested uh, as a possible alternative to simply American history. And of course it would be true, it's certainly not the history of working people uh, who are most of the American population. It's a history of the people who have been in power in this country for a very long time. So yes, we could use a truly American history History is without a doubt the only subject that the more you study it, the dumber you get. College professors in math are delighted if you've had more high school math. They'll put you in advanced math course. But in history, this is not so. You have to break the icons, you have to break down the mythology, the lies, if you will, that you learned in high school and even in middle school and elementary school. You're really better off if you didn't learn them in the first place. I would argue there's an awful lot of opportunities to use history to understand educational policy, um, urban development, to understand industrial growth and change. So in some ways, without using history, the policymakers in this country are solving the problems with one hand tied behind their back. We might think about what are the functions of public history. Um, I think the biggest single function is to rouse the public to a state of patriotism, or maybe better put, nationalism. And this doesn't necessarily mean nationalism for the country as a whole. Maybe it's better put, nationalism for the cause that is being celebrated here. Across the country, civic leaders have paid tribute to Christopher Columbus by naming streets and cities after him and by putting up statues. Um, I learned in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and we made uh, little milk pint, uh, you know, ships, and it wasn't even until college that I learned the truth about it. He discovered uh, America in 1492, and I think it's appropriate that we recognize him, an Italian American, for uh, what they've done for our country. He's a symbol of the greatness of Italians and what Italians have brought to this country. The Queen of Spain, she gave the support for him to come and conquer America. Sail the, the Ocean Blue in 1942. 1492. His true significance doesn't come from 1492. 
He didn't do anything in 1492 that Leif Erikson hadn't done in 1002 or so. It comes from 1493, because in 1493, this man persuades the king and queen of Spain to outfit him with 17 ships, with between 1,000 and 2,000 soldiers, with 20 dogs, attack dogs, with horses, with armor, and he proceeds to take over the island of Haiti and rename it Hispaniola. Now, this had never been done before in human history, for one country to maintain uh, and conquer a country on the other side of an ocean. This was a first. When he came in there, on our country, he don't come for good, he came to steal. Columbus worked a marvelous deal with the king and queen of Spain. Uh, he was to get 10% of all the riches he brought back from the, quote, new world, but he also was to get 10% of everything everybody else brought back. So uh, it, was, it was a great deal. He wasn't able to enforce it all. Uh, they changed the contract terms unilaterally, but he did become rich. But Columbus ran into a problem during his first visit to the New World. He couldn't find the huge gold deposits that he promised to his investors. So the drive to satisfy the profits of his uh, financiers drove him to awful acts. He uh, punished the Indians who wouldn't bring him enough gold. He hacked off their arms. He killed them. And when he couldn't find enough gold, he enslaved them and brought them back in chains to, to Spain. He had to show his patrons something that represented wealth, if not gold, human wealth. Christopher Columbus started the transatlantic slave trade. Now you have to understand the transatlantic slave trade began from west to east. It was a trade in Native Americans, or Indians, taken across the Atlantic to be enslaved in the Azores, in the Canary Islands, and in Spain itself. And the only reason it didn't work is because Native Americans were not immune to the diseases that were already common in Europe and Asia and Africa. And then there's the flat earth myth. Because, you know, at the time, a lot of people still thought the world was, was flat. Everybody in Europe knew that the world was round. The Catholic Church held it to be round. Sailors especially know it to be round. And there's this whole mythology about Christopher Columbus had to face down a uh, near mutiny from his sailors who were afraid of sailing off the edge of the flat earth. What do you want? We want to know whether you're ready to turn back and start for home. Yeah! yeah. Oh. yeah. And at once! It's no business of yours, but the answer is no. All right, we'll turn back and sail without you. Come on, boys! This mythology, it turns out, was established by none other than Washington Irving in about 1830. He's the, um, the guy who wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He's a novelist. Well, in 1830 or so, he wrote a biography of Christopher Columbus. Three volumes. It was the most popular biography of the 19th century. Stayed in print throughout the century. And he told the story the flat earth story. So the world did not become flat in 1491 just before Columbus sailed. The world became flat in 1830. This map of the round world was commissioned by the Pope to be translated from Greek into Latin in Florence, Italy in 1410, 82 years before Columbus set sail. In Columbus's right hand is a decree the words are chiseled into the base of the statue. By the grace of God, and in the name of Her Majesty, Queen Isabella, I am taking possession of this land October 12, 1492. Spain and Columbus got their authority to take the property and the lives of non-Christians from a papal decree called the Doctrine of Discovery. The Pope cut a deal with Spain and Portugal. He divided the world in half by drawing a line on a map and gave title of the Eastern Hemisphere to Portugal and the Western Hemisphere to Spain. Well, this wasn't a deal that Denmark agreed to or that England agreed to. And so France and England and Holland and Denmark, they want, it, want in on the deal and they all steal uh, and take over various parts of the Americas. Uh, it was the first great imperialism in the history of the world. At the top of the pedestal, an inscription says, to Christopher Columbus, 
Discoverer of America. He wasn't here first. I think he actually, um, it was like the Keys or down in the Bahamas. It was down in Cuba or somewhere. Well, he wasn't here first. The Native Americans were here first. The Vikings were here first. And actually, my dad asked me once, you know what Columbus did? I said, yeah, he discovered Cuba. Yeah, it's pretty impressive what he did. <laughs> and what was that? Crossing the Atlantic from Spain to Plymouth Rock. Okay. Christopher Columbus never reached North America. The only part of what is now the United States that he reached was Puerto Rico. So in 1492, there were some 100 million natives living in the Americas. Should they be credited with discovering America instead of Columbus? Um, yeah, I suppose they should be. Um, problem is we don't have a date in when they came over. So it's easier to celebrate, you know, Christopher Columbus and uh, when he came over. Sure, they discovered it, but they didn't do a thing about it. They didn't go over to Europe and say, hey, look at this land we discovered. They were just there in the first place. About 25 years ago, uh, a couple of Native, a batch of Native Americans tried to make this point, and I think they did make it. Um, Adam Nordwall, who is an Ojibwa Indian, and some other Native Americans, took an Alitalia flight to Rome, and they discovered Italy. Here's my opportunity to go over to a land where the doctrine of discovery originated from, the Vatican. And the idea was to lay claim of discovery of their country of Italy, just to turn things completely around. I stuck a spear in that ground, proclaiming my discovery of this new land for the American Indian people. When I'm introduced to the Pope, he's standing there, and I walk forward in measured steps. And as I walk slowly toward him, he raises his hand with this big, beautiful ring on it. Well, I understand what that's all about. And as he raises his hand to me, I raise my hand to him. And I'm wearing a big, beautiful ring. Now, there's an audible gasp in the Vatican because here's their two guys holding their rings out to each other to kiss. The cardinals, the bishops, the pope's aides, there's going to be an international incident between His Holiness and the Indian. And the pope broke the ice. And one of the things he said to me, I've read a great deal about the American Indian people, and I know what you are doing. Did your meeting with the pope resolve the issues between Native Americans and the Catholic Church? No, because the Vatican never apologized to Native Americans for the crimes committed in the name of the church against our people. Today is Columbus Day, a national holiday set aside to honor the explorer who 512 years ago made landfall in the West Indies. It's a day in which Italian Americans take special pride and others take exception. <laughs> Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa, Italy. He sailed from Spain in 1492 with the blessing of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. After numerous attempts to convince the Queen Isabella that to reach India in the east, one could sail towards the west, since he noticed that a ship's mast was the last visible sign of a ship in the horizon. The Nina de Pinta and the Santa Maria took more than two months. He set sail on August 3, 1492 from Palos, Spain. Columbus's first impression of Native Americans was very favorable. Why aren't you guys celebrating? We're not celebrating because we don't agree with celebrating genocide. The genocide of indigenous people were massacred in the millions on this continent. I think that uh, it's, it's uh, proper to celebrate it, and I guess I don't quite understand all the controversy, uh, why there's such a big controversy. Uh, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. I mean, if you take anything far enough, you can pick it apart. What do you think about Christopher Columbus as an explorer? I think that Christopher Columbus was in the service of imperialism. Christopher Columbus was a mercenary. I think 
it was a little bit of uh, poetic justice and it coming out that Christopher Columbus probably wasn't the first one here and that found in America. Kind of hurt to find that out, but uh, I think it is the truth. The truth will set you free, isn't that the saying goes? Yes, the past is the past, but the past lives with us. Uh, the past affects us. Our memory of the past affects us. People often tell me, you can't judge the past by the standards of today. Uh, you're being presentist. I think that's BS, by which of course I mean bad sociology. For instance, are we applying today's morality, the morality of the 21st century about slavery, back to Columbus or back to other slave traders? Well, I can tell you a bunch of people were against slavery back then. It's not just we are so smart and we're so moral now and we're against slavery. All of the slaves were against slavery, but a bunch of white folks were against slavery too. I personally would like to see more attention given to Bartolome de las Casas. Now, I, people say, who? Bartolome who? He's the guy who wrote down Columbus's journals. He became the defender of the Indians, and he participated for decades thereafter in trying to make sure that Spain respected Indian rights. I don't think there's a single perspective that we have now that wasn't an issue at the time. The past is just like the biological past. We are all shaped by our families, our medical history, um, and in some ways, the more we know about our own medical history, the smarter decisions we can make about our own life and our own health. Same thing with history, that these things aren't just dead. Um, the way that I heard stories about how my grandparents were treated uh, during the era of Jim Crow segregation shapes who I am, shapes how I react to things. My point in bringing up these um, hidden facts of American history is not simply to go back, not simply to be sorry about what happened, and not even to condemn uh, people like Columbus or Andrew Jackson or Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, it's too late for that. They're gone. The events are gone. The point of going back uh, and looking at those things is to see what they teach us about the present. In Romania, thousands gathered in Free Press Square today in Bucharest to watch the removal of a statue of Lenin. The provision when people of foreign countries have thrown out their dictator rulers, they've also toppled the monuments representing them. It will be an enduring symbol of the fall of Baghdad, a huge statue of Saddam Hussein. Americans haven't done much toppling, with one exception. The most toppled statue in America is the monument to the Haymarket Riot in Chicago. On May 4, 1886, laborers gathered to demonstrate against the police's killing of two workers the previous day during a strike for an eight-hour workday at the McCormick Reaper plant. When most of the crowd had left, a police captain raised his arm and shouted, In the name of the people of Illinois, I command you to disperse in peace. The police then began clubbing people. Someone in the crowd threw a bomb, killing six police officers. The police opened fire, killing seven protesters. After a controversial trial, which gained worldwide attention, four of the organizers were sentenced to death and hanged, though evidence never proved they were responsible for the bomb. Throughout the world, May Day has become Labor Day in remembrance of the Haymarket events and is celebrated on or near May 1st. The U.S. and Canada celebrate in September. On May 4th, 1889, the third anniversary of the riot, a statue of the police captain with his arm raised was erected as a memorial to the slain policeman. Workers protested that the monument was one-sided and over the years it was relocated several times to prevent it from being toppled. That ended on May 4, 1927, the 41st anniversary of the riot, when a streetcar jumped its tracks and hit the statue. The disgruntled driver said he was tired of seeing the policeman with his arm raised.
The second toppling occurred on October 5th, 1969, when a radical group called the Weathermen put dynamite between the statue's legs and blew them onto the nearby expressway. On May 4th, 1970, the statue was rededicated. On October 5th, the Weathermen, now calling themselves the Weather Underground, blew it up a second time. The city recast the legs again and moved it to the top of police headquarters until they realized their safety was at risk. The statue now sits in the atrium of the Chicago Police Academy and may be viewed by appointment only. Today, a new monument representing both labor and the police sits on the original site of the riot. Now some people want to topple offensive monuments or just deface offensive historical markers. And they have a point. I mean, some of them are so wrong that maybe nothing is better than them. But another way to do it would be to add layers, to have uh, an apology on the landscape, if you will, that apologizes for this offensive uh, historical marker or monument or whatever. So the person coming there is really challenged to think because they not only see how somebody thought in 1898, they also see how somebody thought very differently in 1998. During the last year of the Civil War, black Union troops charged into battle screaming, Remember Fort Pillow. But if you visit the fort, you won't find out what the troops were remembering. The park's brochure says that Union casualties were heavy especially among the black troops, but it doesn't explain that twice as many black soldiers died compared to white soldiers. An exhibit in the museum titled The Controversy includes a New York Sun article that describes the massacre. The exhibit implies that the article is Northern propaganda. What the museum doesn't display is a New York Times article in which, right after the battle, a Confederate general told the Times correspondent that it was against the policy of his government to spare the life of Negro soldiers or their officers. The POWs at Fort Pillow, first of all, had a heck of a time becoming a POW, because when they tried to surrender, many of them were shot at the spot. The Confederacy saying there would be no black POWs really comes out of two things. One is a real fear of what would happen when former slaves joined the Union Army and turn their rage against their master. So one of the ways to control that is to try to send a message that if you do join the army, you will be given no quarter. Um, and the hope was that that would um, clamp down on black enlistment. I suppose also probably a realization that, that the North's enlistment of black soldiers meant that the North would now have a military advantage that it didn't have before which turned out to be true because the black soldiers were crucial in the last stage of the war. The other Pete part of that, though, was also the notion that in the minds of many Southerners, these people are still property. They are not equals, so therefore you do not want to accord them the rights that you would accord an equal soldier. So it was really a way of reinforcing the attitude of racial inferiority. You know, the point uh, of looking at the massacres of black people is to ask the question, uh, while we're not committing massacres anymore, do we still look upon uh, black people as not us, as different? Because we have, as a people, used, as American people, used the Civil War as that great moment to say, even when we killed each other, we ultimately could come back together and that's why we always celebrate those pictures of old Confederate soldiers and old Yankees shaking hands at Gettysburg in 1913. But all of that reunion was based on erasing the African American story out of the Civil War and erasing the fact that that reunification of North and South came at the expense of the black community. There are some indications that uh, given the past of of, of this fort and of this property as a park, uh, that uh, it has more of a very strong southern 
slant to it and very pro-Southern, and we're trying to, trying to get beyond that. The real challenge is to tell a Civil War that includes a Northern story, a Southern story, an African-American story that will ultimately allow us to get to an American story. Monuments don't tell the truth for various reasons. There's reasons to distort. For one thing, only one side is usually telling the story. It's usually a monument being put up by the, a labor union, or being put up by African Americans, or being put up by neo-Confederates, that is, people who, who still favor the Confederacy side of the Civil War, put up by one group. They don't have a real interest in telling all sides of the story. It's particularly too bad on historical markers because historical markers automatically come with two sides. Monuments are selected to reflect national or regional or local identity. So they're really important because they tell us what people want you to remember, what they want you to believe, not necessarily what is really important to you, but what's important to those people who are creating the myth of your identity. The real question is not whether the government is involved, but how it is involved and whether the uh, decisions about monuments and decisions about historical markers are made by a small number of people in the government or made by a real cross-section of the American people. Clearly we need an educated, thoughtful public. For that reason, the government should be involved in telling complex stories complexly and thoroughly. And in some places, we do do this. We need to do it at all places. The final stop on my trip was the mother of all monuments, Mount Rushmore. The closer I got to the monument, the less it seemed anyone was willing to talk about it. Actually, could, um, we're doing a piece on monuments. I know about film. Would you mind if I asked you a couple questions about like, your, your opinion? Why don't you shut the camera off? Any, any uh, way we could keep it on? I don't want it on it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mount Rushmore has been coined America's Shrine of Democracy. But this is ironic not only because of the park's history, but also because of how the park's image is protected today. You can do guided tours um, at the times, starting at 10.30 and then lasting until 4.30, 10.30, 11.30, 12.30. And you can just meet the ranger right there in that main viewing terrace. He, of course, needed someone with that vision, that imagination, an artist. And this is when he contacted a man by the name of Gutzon Borglum, who was a pretty well-known artist at the time. Gutzon Borglum was carving a Confederate memorial onto the mountain there when he received this letter from Don Robinson asking him to come here to the Black Hills to find out more about it. Any other questions before we move along the walkway? So once again, everyone, thank you very much for joining me here on the trail today. Enjoy the rest of your day at the memorial. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a good day. Any questions? Yes. What was uh, Guts and Borglum's affiliation with the Ku Klux Klan? What was Guts and Borglum's affiliation with the Ku Klux Klan? I'm not sure about that. I've never read anything about that myself. Maybe you had to join to get that job down in Georgia. <laughs> I don't believe that the issue of Gutzon Borglum as a Ku Klux Klan member uh, needs to be a part of the story at Mount Rushmore. I think that definitely should be told. No doubt about it. If he's an uh, ex-KKK member, he definitely needs to. That should be known. They should tell the dark side as well as the bright side. And at one point he became not only a member of the Ku Klux Klan, but really a, a high up leader advising part of the Klan membership. Well, I see the, the yeah. elements of democracy. Just to have the opportunity to be a Ku Klux Klan member, I think, would be part of the democratic philosophy. I think that's a, I think it's a nice melting pot of this country to be able to say, I, I'm a Ku Klux Klan member, and I can still put Abe Lincoln on the, on the rock. Mount Rushmore's story, as I said, is about the development of the memorial. 
And our themes do not dwell a lot on Borglum as a, as a life, what his life really was like. Do you think tour groups or just people like us that show up here should at least know anything about his background? No. In my opinion, no. It's not that no, but I think it's Where he was born, those kind of things, yeah. I'd be interested in that. It's done a great thing. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, why cover it up? Everybody's talking about now, let's be open, let's be more diverse and everything. Let's talk about it. Maybe some good to come out of it. Maybe we can learn from history. That's what we're supposed to do. Another thing that should be told at Mount Rushmore is the fact that this monument is on Lakota land, which we guaranteed to the Sioux forever. After the 1876 treaty uh, that was signed at Fort Laramie, the uh, Native Americans were given the Black Hills. The government had no land to cede to us. We were the original people. We were the original land holders, the landlords. Then the Custer Expedition came through, and many people followed the Custer Expedition because they had found gold in the Black Hills. And as more and more people came into the hills, the cavalry tried to keep, you know, the Indians and the, and the white people separated, but they couldn't do it. No, actually, the role of the cavalry in those days was to subdue and to subjugate the Indians, to put them on reservations. If they were off the reservation, they were hostiles, and you could kill them. So then the, the native people really weren't given the land. Uh, there was eventually a court case that settled that and actually provided them a monetary figure for the land. Uh, but the Native American people have never accepted that uh, buyout, and the, land, uh, the money is still in escrow in the federal government. I don't know why you can't add that story. I don't see what that hurts. They wouldn't talk about it because it's such a controversial issue and it's never been settled. So it's not something if they brought it up during their program that they could easily answer or easily solve. It's interesting, when people present a certain point of view of history, it's not controversial. As soon as you present the other side, they call it controversial. <laughs> They have so much on the building of Mount Rushmore, and we celebrate you know, the individuals that did that. Add a little more to understand why this is contested space for certain populations of our, of our country, because of what they envisioned those hills versus the way the hills are now used. And also, if you do the loop, you'll stop down here at the Sculpture Studio, which is really nice. It houses Guts and Borglum's last working model from 1936. If you can create an environment where people can talk about these difficult issues, then it makes it easier to solve other problems down the road. To criticize the evil, and whatever the government does is not anti-American, it's anti-government, and it's pro-American, it's pro the people, it's pro the country. We can think about how we have gotten to this state in all of our glory, in all of our disasters, whatever, the mix that we are. Then we could bring about the America of the future more intelligently. Textbook statues talk about virtues. Learn the whole story, play it, then you choose. We told we a great country founded on democracy. Lying about the past, that's hypocrisy. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In 93, he stole all he could see. A scientist, a sea man discoverer, he's nothing but a tourist. Looking for gold with a bloodthirst. Yeah, the truth hurts in his blue verse. But the true birds ask me the true words, cause I'm true word. You tell me the way things work is fair. If I don't like it, there's an exit over there. But oh, contra, mon frere, I'll make you a dare. Try to walk on my tent to see if fair's fair. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee. I sing whatever. <laughs>
man, man, man. History, you know. <laughs> you know, they just looking at us. This is real history right here. Down. Get along with this second verse. Uh -huh. Call it what you want, but I call it a mystery. Their version of the past is called history, but that's his story. Bear arms to mercy, and when I tell my side, it's controversy. Monuments for racists, killers, and thieves. Oh, and why you at it? Hand over your keys. It's propaganda, distortion, it's idiotic. But when I tell them it's wrong, I'm unpatriotic. A pain, you got it. Government broke a tree, they greed to get their pockets meat. Stole the black hills from the Sioux Nation, put Indians on reservations. Man named Borg from Chisel, four faces to worship the white Anglo Saxon. And races, amazing bases, it's patriotic galore. I'm talking about Rushmore. Ask question, there's Mount Hushmore. Yeah, you know, they talking about unpatriotic. Not being unpatriotic, just trying to find out the truth. That's right. You know? Yeah. History. This little third verse action. Check this out. Yeah. Our past has been censored, cheap like penny pinches, truth and dentures, special interest ventures, frustrated confederates during the civil war, attacked black troops, sent them to heaven's door. I'm supposed to be cool, can't support mellow, forget about what happened at Fort Pillow, my words finally tuned like a cello, do you understand what I'm saying, hello, when you read the plaque on the statue, it's lying at you, this gumshoe is here to prove it's not all true, I hope I knock you out of your seats and realize this the real history of our American peeps, my country tis of thee, sweet land of mythology of the I sing of the I sing right, you know. 